Um, first of all, I should maybe introduce myself. My name is Carsten Baldorf. I'm, a, I'm working at Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Society here in Berlin. Also here I am in Berlin. Hans is in Munich. You also have your locations. Um, and I'm also a member of the Fermat uh, NFDI consortium. And I have the honor today to present uh, Hans Bungartz to you. Um, his background is, um, I, I would say, math and computer science, but he has always worked towards uh, um, applications in engineering, material science, and physics. Yeah? Um, and this is, for example, uh, exemplified in his PhD thesis, where he worked on approaches, approaches to solving Poisson's equation. Yeah? Besides that, one of his big interests is, interest is indeed uh, IT infrastructure, and that's something that he's going to talk um, to us about today. Um, and he has been working on that also as a service to the community, so to say. And from 2006 to 2013, he was a member and chair of the IT Infrastructure Commission of the DFG, the German research uh, organization. Um, and he was involved in the, yeah, the, in the strate strate strategic planning of uh, IT resources. Yeah? Um, he was also chairperson of the DFN, the German Research Network Infrastructure. Uh, which is essentially also that player, for example, for distributed authorization and authentication. That is, for example, an important aspect uh, for the, the NFDI, yeah? but also the other aspects, like simply a network that works is quite crucial. And uh, since more than 10 years, he's also in the board of the Leibniz Rechenzentrum, the computing center of Bavaria, which is one of Germany's largest computing centers and also on the European scale, a tier zero computing center. So those are the big ones. Yeah, and where, yes, he's actually also a professor. Yeah, so besides all the other things, he also has time for that at uh, TU Munich. And he's also area leader here in our Fermat consortium. Um, I think that was enough from my side. Hans, please. Yeah, thanks very much, Casper, uh, for this nice introduction. And uh, uh, I found particularly appealing your formulation he's also a professor and I, I try to do so still yes so first of all please all accept my apologies for not being a physicist not even with a minor so I hope uh, that we can agree on that nobody is perfect so what I would today discuss a bit is uh, this kind of recursive use of this uh, word infrastructure because of the fact that the NFDI itself has the eye of an infrastructure then there are a couple of um, activities going on in the NFDI as a whole to create infrastructure, but then of course also within the consortia, for example, within Fermat, we are taking care of, of uh, infrastructure in a, in a specific um, um, uh, area we have there in the... Um, what I want today to speak on today is first of all, providing a bit the context, computational science and and engineering, so which is this, which is this part of science that actually demands most uh, IT infrastructure? Then focusing a bit on what is already available, what happens currently, what has happened in the past, what happens currently in uh, Germany, and then briefly explaining uh, what is the uh, Fermat way, uh, so to say. So I don't like it to speak too often with this word revolution, but I mean, one ongoing revolution we have seen in science now for quite some decades is definitely this computational one uh, that you, we can use computers and very important, not only the machines, but also of course computation. So the process is dealing with the machines to uh, yeah, enhance science and it has really opened new pathways. The, the first thing probably was that theories suddenly became capable of generating data through simulations, for example. The more recent one is that data can be used to generate models. So first of all, data were just used to generate some kind of insight or result. And these days, they are really used to, to, to also um, foster and support uh, theory. Then, very important, uh, there's no, nowadays the possibility, which has not been there before, to combine experimental and, and theoretical data results in a much more systematic way than it has been done previously. And just to give you one example, what I mean with this, or how it has been done previously. So this short video uh, was done in the DFG research unit. Um, so Forscher Gruppe uh, 493 on fluid structure interactions uh, now 17 years ago. Uh, 
this is a kind of a, a flag in a in a wind tunnel. So the wind comes from above, and below you see this elastic this elastic structure. On the left hand side, this is a film on the, of the uh, experiment, and on the right hand side you see the computation. And well, one can see that uh, basically, um, roughly speaking, it is similar, at least what the, what means the quantitative behavior. And this is kind of a classical validation. What I mean with old school validation, people did an experiment, they made a calculation, they uh, transferred this into a visualization, and then they compared with their with their eyes. So that's old school validation, and this can be done today, of course, in a much more sophisticated way. Yeah, the latest editions of these combinations probably are this kind of physics enhanced, augmented, informed, or whatever uh, machine learning that we want to again combine. Uh, the knowledge we have from physics, physics here standing just for uh, a much bigger uh, science understanding, of course, uh, combine this with um, data and with learning processes we can start once we have uh, the data. Okay, so frequently there's this a picture of these paradigms, so kind of basic approaches you can use to, to, to get insight in, into science. Um, so there are the two classical ones. Uh, I don't want to discuss or argue about the, the order. Some say some some say the experiment was first. Others say the thought, the theory was first. But we agree that there's experimental research, classical one, and there's there's uh, theoretical research. And then I think the basic new thing that has joined the additional thing is actually what I would call computational uh, research. So and this has different flavors and different facets. And sometimes people say that these different facets are paradigms of their own. Uh, I would just call them appearances of actually the same um, uh, paradigm. So 3A was the historically first one that was model driven. So starting from some theoretical knowledge, starting, starting from a mathematical or physical model, people derived some simulations and at the end of the day were able to produce data. So that's what I call a, a deductive science approach. So you start from the from the from the theorem and you produce a kind of data results. The, the, the more recent one is uh, 3B that you do it just the other way around. So you you start from data and you use uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever kind of tools in an inductive way. So you just start without any kind of a theory if you do it from 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 scratch and by trying to derive uh, equations relations whatever from 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 that so now one could ask if these things are just ping and pong why do so many people call it the third and the fourth fourth paradigm so one reason is that the methodical background is quite uh, different so if you think of simulation that typically comes out of mathematical modeling, numerical analysis, playing a big part, of course, in scientific computing, high performance computing, and of course, a lot of input from the domain science. On the other hand, the background of AI, machine learning is more theoretical computer science, discrete mathematics, statistics, data mining, data analytics, neural networks. And these are basically completely yeah, different or orthogonal even um, communities. And that's why, Many people argue in this way, third and fourth paradigm, but I really think it's very closely related. So my, my picture is already that. On the one side, you have models. On the other side, you have data. And now you can do the ping and the pong, either deductive, then you have simulation size, science, or you do it in an inductive way, and then you have data science. One thing that combines those ping and pong directions also is that both tremendously need uh, HPC. And HPC now really stands in the original sense of the word. So not necessarily going for the very, very big machines. Of course, many need them, but really aiming at high performance, high efficiency computing. So this can also be a GPU or a small set of um, um, GPU, but actually you have to take care of performance. You just cannot take any machine and 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 start your com computation. That's also something that that combines these. Well, this HPC now brings us a bit closer to uh, our infrastructure uh, topic. So uh, computational X, as I would like to call it. So with X, you can imagine science, physics, engineering, 
neuroscience, even humanities, whatever you would like um, to, to read here. This needs infrastructure. And so what kind of infrastructure actually is, is, is needed? The first thing, which is quite obvious, and that's typically meant when people speak of, or meant first when people speak of infrastructure, is of course a computing uh, uh, infrastructure. So this can range from uh, my cluster below my desk, which is a classical scientist's uh, attitude. Uh, when you get a, an offer for a professorship, you typically uh, cry very loudly that you are doing very computationally intense work. And for that, you need your own cluster under your desk or in the cellar of your institute or whatever. But it also includes, of course, high performance computing, both in the in the capacity, so in the sense of the throughput, but also in the capability sense, you need the biggest machines to really get a uh, new kind of uh, results. It means GPU, it means cloud computing. So a lot of compute tasks today um, just need cycles, no longer a specific architecture or a specific machine, but you just need cycles. And of course, edge computing, so uh, which is a more decentralized vision of that. So let the computing happen where the data are, for example, and not where the big, where the big computers are. And of course, embedded systems are a, a part of that also. But that's not all. So the next, you need a connectivity um, infrastructure. So first of all, a lot of science is these days global science. So if you think of these uh, big um, physics uh, instruments like uh, CERN, Large Hadron Collider being the, being the prototype, but there are many more astro astrophysics, cosmology, and so on. Uh, so you need access to different places. Uh, you need access to infrastructure, but of course also access to other places where people work on that for, for example, collaborative work. So you need a, lo a good local connection, which is the famous last mile, but you also need a remote connection. And of course, this access has to be regulated. So Carsten in the beginning already mentioned that this authorization or authentication thing is of course an important thing not only access management, but also identity management. So that's the I. So you would not like to have for each uh, location in such kind of a consortium, really your own identity. You, you need your login, you need your, your uh, password, but you would like to have something that fits for all. So something, for example, we have explored in the last years with this Eduroam accounts, which is, I think, really something very helpful where we don't have to remember what was my password at Duke University or what. Or whatever. So that's the second kind of infrastructure. And the third one, of course, is the data one. Uh, we have, we need to have data available. So when we need some specific data for our research, we need that they are there, and we we need that they can that we can access them. Uh, we need uh, different schemas to to agree on a kind of a uh, language in which we would like to 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 store and, and then also to retrieve this kind of data. Archiving is very important sometimes for legal reasons, if you think of medical data, sometimes also for reproduci reproducibility purposes. And that, of course, uh, can a bit be summarized in this, in this fair, fair word. Sometimes which is something which is maybe not that obvious is that we also need, to some extent, at least the functionality uh, infrastructure. So people typically think that why is this an infrastructure? I'm doing the simulations or I'm doing the analytics myself. Yes, that's probably true for a scientist to some extent, but typically not to all extents. So there are these days a lot of uh, research groups that just use some piece of a simulation software. They haven't written that on their own, they are just using it. So there come, of course, things like licensing issues, or I would like to do some simulation as a service, just push the button and get some results. And of course, many people these days also ask for analytics as a service. So I don't want to have my own um, TensorFlow expert or whatever. I would, I would prefer that I can define a workflow that represents my kind of doing research. And uh, I can just use analytics tools or access to analytics tools uh, as a service. Maybe I don't even need to, this software to be installed in one of my machines at my institution. I can just use it and play with it. So that's what I would call a functionality infrastructure. And of course, there's software. This is something which 
I think is still tremendously neglected in the in the science and in the science funding landscape. We are currently also exploring this in 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 uh, Fermat, and I think people like Markus Scheiten can tell stories about that. That a lot of the things we are doing there in terms of preparing, improving IT infrastructure is actually writing software, of course, and and not just hacking something or writing down something, but really keeping it uh, maintainable, uh, keeping it sustainable. Um, so what is sometimes called these days research software engineering, I think this is also something where we need an infrastructure on and not to forget, of course, uh, all these things do not work if we don't have uh, the right people, people we need for, for support of users at very different levels because user communities typically are very heterogeneous, but also people we need for, for the further development of our um, infrastructure. Okay, so some brief remarks on what is there uh, in Germany. So let's just begin with the, with the computing um, part. Um, so there we probably have the most elaborate uh, IT infrastructure, which is centered around this uh, hierarchical uh, pyramid uh, being subdivided in different tiers. So tier zero is typically considered to be the European one. Tier one is a national uh, German one. Tier um, two, you could call it is the regional or topical one. And then tier three is the institutional one. And then there's another tier, which is typically not explicitly mentioned, but this is then the, the uh, cluster below my desk or institutes clusters in the cellar or, what, or, what, or whatever. And I try to represent this typically uh, yeah, working lot feeling a bit by this picture on the on the lower right hand side. So we have here a European structure since uh, 2010. This is Sprays. We have for the tier one, the, the Gauss Center for uh, Supercomputing, which is now already rather old. So in terms of computer science, of course, it was founded in, in 2007 as kind of a union of the three uh, national tier one centers. So in Jülich, um, Stuttgart and uh, München, then we have the tier one, the established structure was the Gulf Al Alliance, so established shortly after uh, GCS, so an, an association of roughly 20 computing centers, some having a regional uh, task, so Landesrechner, so a state computer, others have a more uh, topical uh, task, like, like the ones of the uh, Max Planck uh, Society, for example. And then you have the, the tier three, which is the, the next layer where we have seen in the last years or even uh, one to two decades, a lot of activities at the state levels, for example. I have just printed three examples here. There's of course more in Germany. So there's Convia, which is a Bavarian state structure. We have BWHPC, which is the structure in the state of Baden-Württemberg. And we have HPC.NRW, uh, which is the respective structure in the state of uh, North Rhine-Westphalia. So the principles are, as I said, hierarchy. So the machines are bigger and more powerful, the higher um, they um, are in the pyramid. They also require more user expertise, of course, if you want to use, really use this uh, machines in, an, in a um, decent way. You see that there are some central spirit behind, so it makes no sense to have in Germany 20 machines of the highest class, so there is some focusing. But on the other hand, uh, there is not only one. So we have this, this idea of three top layer machines and of, of, of 20 maybe in the uh, next one. Yeah, and I forgot now this latest development, which is this NHR, so this um, National High Performance Computing which is the, the successor or the new, also sustainable infrastructure for this, for this tier um, two. And also there, uh, we have a couple of uh, eight or so uh, centers that uh, really provide this kind of service. So there's an, a central aspect, there's a distributed aspect, there's a hierarchical aspect. And I think this is very nice and very important to describe how such kind of an infrastructure is really uh, placed in a in a in a good way, and and this um, this distribution allows, of course, then you, also that you have some diversity. For example, there's this 
that this principle in this Gauss uh, center, center computers, let's say, should be procured not all at the same time, but let's say uh, two years here, then two, in the two next years there, and in the next two years in the in the in the next location, just to make sure that each technology generation is always present at one machine in in uh, uh, Germany. And in the NHR, for example, people try to also establish some, some focus diversity. So one center maybe focuses on, on physics applications, the other center focuses on AI, a third center focuses on numerical expertise. So this is also the nice thing if you have such kind of a, of a uh, well distributed and not too central uh, infrastructure. So I think this picture allows much more uh, insight than just looking at the fancy icons, because that that's really a piece of architecture, and it shows how such kind of a landscape um, can or maybe even should be uh, designed. Okay, concerning the connectivity, the picture is maybe a bit simpler um, because uh, there is a, a rather established uh, landscape we have within Germany um, DFN. Uh, which was already founded in 1984, so it's quite established now in the meantime, has a, a membership of something like 350, so basically all, all German universities and non-university research institutions are these days members, and on, at the European level we have a similar construction uh, in uh, the sense of Géon. Um, so both are to some extent bottom-up, so they have been uh, founded by a union of, uh, in the DFN uh, sense, institutions. Uh, so that's kind of a self-organization. So there's not a funding agency coming and says, well, it would be nice to have something, for example, as it was the case with, with the NFDI, but it was really something that uh, came bottom up in a, in a, to some extent, you could say anarchic way. And of course they used the, 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 uh, the instrument people in Germany typically use for any kind of activity, so it's a Verein, of course, or in English you would call it an, an association. Lyon is also in such kind of an association, but with a different notion of, of membership, so in DFN, and, and, and that's also interesting to have this as a picture for IT infrastructure. So in DFN, users are the members, user institutions, universities, Max Planck Institutes, Fraunhofer Institutes are the members in the DFN, whereas the members in Gion are the national uh, research network. So DFN is a member in uh, Gion, so that's kind of an additional layer. There is no direct institutional membership of a specific university um, in, in Gion. So there again, you have this kind of hierarchical or layered design of an, of an IT infrastructure. Then concerning uh, this, what I call functionality infrastructure, I would just like to focus on one thing that has recently seen a lot of activities, and this is um, the analytics uh, part. So if you go back uh, 10 years or so, there was almost nothing there in Germany, and then came the first competence centers that have been founded for, for this data, uh, kind of thing, so big data uh, competence center, they were at that time um, called. Um, and then came the, the next generation uh, of uh, AI uh, centers uh, and machine learning centers, all being funding formats by uh, the federal government, so by the VMBS, so the federal ministries. So, so this is a bit different, for example, to what we have seen with uh, uh, DFN which was just something that emerged uh, bottom up. And of course, with these structures here, also a lot of scientists were crying bottom up in a bottom up way. Hey folks from politics, you have to do something. But, end of the, but at the end of the day, it was kind of a competition. The BMBF organized and then uh, a specific number of uh, centers here uh, uh, came out of this competition. Of course, there are, there are many more, or well, not many more, but some, some more in, in, in Northern Westphalia, in Tübingen, and so on. So he, I'm, I've just written here down the logos of the ones in, in Berlin, in Dresden, Leipzig, and in uh, Munich. Something which is also interesting, 
and which is to some extent also a bit untypical that uh, what we have seen here is a very fast step into a sustained funding. So uh, the, the first versions of these centers, they were all project-based for three years, for five years, for six years, whatever. But uh, in the last year, uh, these centers all became more or less, uh, I would call it eternalized. So they, they got this sustainability perspective, which is not uh, the normal or the typical thing. For example, if you think back to the high-performance computing, uh, infrastructure there, the, the three top systems in Jülich, uh, Stuttgart and München, they are just a project basis. So every five or six years, there's a, there's a project defined between the federal government and the Sitzländer, so the, the three states of Baden-Württemberg, North Rhine-Westfalen and uh, Bavaria, and they give money for the next generation of computers. But this is not a kind of an institutional funding like with the Leibniz Institute or whatever, it is just kind of a project uh, funding. And when the one project is over, hopefully the next project comes. And, and science, of course, has to argue again towards politics that this is important. Uh, so the NHR is now a step also in the into a direction of a more sustained funding. And in this case here with the uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data infrastructure, this step was done much faster uh, um, to go into this sustainable direction. And I mean, this is also a kind of yeah, specific phenomenon we have seen in the last couple of years that a lot of things that, that were basically impossible to obtain uh, for science from politics suddenly became uh, possible very quickly. If you think of what kind of, what amount of funding has been gone into fields like artificial intelligence or or quantum, quantum computing, that's really amazing if you compare it to what was possible in previous years. Okay, NFDI now leads us a bit in this data direction, of course. Um, so uh, NFDI has been designed as a research data infrastructure for um, Germany. There have been different and very maybe even various pre-initiatives. Uh, at the end of the day, this was an initiative of the Council for Information Infrastructures, kind of an association of, of uh, researchers, people, institutions that deal with uh, such kind of information infrastructures in a, in a broader sense, a much broader sense than IT infrastructure, because information infrastructure also includes, of course, um, uh, not device-bounded uh, infrastructures. So one design principle, and uh, that's interesting, that it was a st very strict community-driven approach. So people even were extremely afraid of that the compute centers might take over or might play a too important part. This is kind of a mistrust, general mistrust, whether well-founded or not, I will come back to that. Uh, but at that point, uh, the idea was let the the different communities organize themselves, define themselves what they need, how they would like to organize, how they would uh, uh, tackle the challenges, and then see uh, what uh, we can do to hopefully represent the complete scientific landscape uh, with this uh, consortia that will be funded uh, at the end. It was also chosen to do this uh, organization as a Verein. Uh, so in the meantime, of course, following several other examples, I mentioned them. And uh, so as, and now that's a bit similar to uh, DFN, you, you again have the situation that the prospective users actually form uh, the basis. So there have been three rounds uh, of calls for, for such thematics so or community-driven consortia. Fermat is one of those that was uh, accepted then in the second uh, round. And, and one point which I would like to explicitly mention here is that hardware through all this process was explicitly excluded. Um, to some extent, this was following the spirit of uh, please God prevent that the compute centers again get a big part of the money to buy big machines. We want that this money really goes into the uh, into the uh, scientific communities and not into those who offer 
uh, IT infrastructure. So from that point of view, that's completely understandable. That's fine. But on the other hand, uh, in this process, no one really took care of providing the infrastructure. And for example, with the NFDI proposals, we then had a very funny situation that those who wrote the proposals, so the different communities, engineering, astrophysics, whatever, they approached the compute centers and said, okay, we, folks, we need a letter of support. Could you please write a letter of support uh, that you will provide our um, uh, consortium in the next, over the next 10 years, uh, 5,000 exabytes per year and unlimited access to all of your infrastructure. And then the proposal writers were very astonished when from the compute centers came the answer where well, we cannot uh, promise that uh, of course we will support the nfdi proposals uh, this is in much in our interest this is our also our mandate but our mandate is bigger we also have other users we have other uh, uh, organizations institutions single researchers that are not organized through the nfdi and we also have to fulfill their needs so what they took, what the consortia then typically got in their proposals was kind of a support statement uh, in the framework of our institutional regulations. And this means that as, as much as we can do, we will do, but we cannot do more for you uh, and in absolute numbers than we are doing for, for others. And that was for many, so at least that was my impression, it was the first time that they realized that oops um, infrastructure or really machinery iron plech at some point would also be uh, necessary yeah and then uh, in addition to these recalls uh, there was from the very beginning there was also the idea to have cross-sectional topics for things that are needed by some or many uh, of the consortia for example and this kind of an uh, authentication and authorization mechanism. It's definitely not helpful and it's a huge waste of money if each consortium would develop its own mechanism, its own technology for, for, for that. There are already things existing or maybe one new thing to be created, whatever, but in a, in a more coordinated uh, way. So it was, came very early that these things should be also funded or included in the context of the NFDI. Uh, the organizations behind the, the NFDI were always very rigid. So in the, in the first round, they said, okay, we see it's important, but please not in the first round, let's postpone it to the second round. In the second round, they said, well, that's very important. We agree, but please not in the second round, let's postpone it to the third round. And then the third round came and now it's basically kind of a round 3A where there's a call for uh, uh, basis the proposals and probably there will be uh, just one that answers to this um, um, call. So that was a rather complicated um, genesis and uh, I'm now really interested to see uh, what this is going to because I think this requirement that it has to deal with something that really all consortia need and the consortia actually reflect the whole scientific diversity uh, we have in Germany. So from the humanities to uh, uh, engineering. And I think this is a very, maybe a too restrictive thing because what is it that really everyone needs? Does it really go far beyond toilet paper? So do we really have uh, then a, a, a a high-tech infrastructure if we require that uh, astrophysicists and uh, librarians from, from a specific uh, kind of um, history of art institution really agree on that they, they need it both. So yeah, but we will see how this basis things this thing develops. Maybe a few general remarks. So whenever people deal with building IT infrastructure, there are a lot of different attitudes and perspectives clashing. And from my perspective, this is far too often, far too ideological. So there's, there's this local versus central thing. Uh, the, the one always cry to, we have to have strong centers and the other say, no, these strong centers dominate us. We have to do it in a, a local way. Then there's a discussion between distributed or federated. There's the virtual view, 
versus the physical view. The physical view says, my machine has to be next to me. The virtual view says, well, independent of where it really is, I want to have direct and immediate access to the infrastructure, then I'm, then I'm fine. There's this, I will come back to this later, uh, this eternal fight between generic and domain specific. So the, the scientific domains typically assume that if computer scientists are involved, they make something absolutely useless just for their fun, something which, is, which tries to address everything, but at the end addresses nothing. And on the other hand, there's the view from the computer science people that if we let physicists, chemists, or engineers, or whomever organize that by themselves, it gets a lousy quality and does not reflect the state of the art, which is, of course, both perspectives are completely idiot. Then there is the typically the debate should we create an additional standalone uh, infrastructure or should it embed it into something that already exists? That was, for example, a discussion. Uh, with all these infrastructures I mentioned. So the, the HPC was the first. So we have this kind of hierarchy. We have these established centers. And then of course there were voices that that, well, handling data and it's not that different. So if we have a high level of competence in these centers, so why not attaching uh, this data center competence also in the HPC centers? Of course, there was also the opposite movement uh, I don't know a specific town. If Bottrop already has the the uh, um, scientific uh, the high performance computing center, Bottrop should not also get the data center. Now it's Gelsenkirchen that should get it. And I mean this is understandable, of course, from a politics point of view, but sometimes also a bit um, irrational. What I consider are very relevant aspects. So in contrast to this more political or emotional. Uh, battles uh, I have mentioned in the in the upper part of the slide are the following ones. So economy of scale effects are important. You have to take into account what amount of money you have to spend for reaching a specific result and whether this amount of money is reasonable. Very prominent example is the hosting of clusters, for example, or of servers. Uh, if you just host one server, you typically also need one person that takes care of that. Uh, if uh, you have 100 servers, you uh, have to take care of, then you definitely do not need 100 people. So that's what, what is typically called an economy of scale uh, effect. Then also use existing competences, don't waste it. If something is there uh, already, then it frequently makes sense to to put something additional as an addendum there. Of course, there's no one size fits all solution. So this is uh, definitely clear. There are specifics from the different projects, from the different scientific disciplines, but a lot can be solved through what I would call homogeneity plus customizing. So really try to have a general pattern, how you design it, but then allow for customizing that the specific needs really can be re reflected then in a, in a specific solution. Maybe some general guidelines. So I'm, I'm a strong advocate of the as generic as possible and as specific as necessary. So driven by the idea, please don't reinvent uh, the wheel. I have so many, I've seen so many proposals for uh, databases, for research data, for example, as a proposal to DFG where one database person plus uh, one specific domain scientist just were applying for getting funding for creating something new because they just stated that in our case, everything is completely different. And, but they never ever had a look at what actually really, really exists. Uh, and the second statement, as central, as federated as possible, and, and as local, as isolated as necessary again. So this economy of scale argument is a strong argument towards centralization, but centralization does not always work. So there are definitely cases where you have to do it in, in another way. And in these cases, please do it in, an, in, an, in another way. Yeah, and of course, safety, security, privacy is something which is today uh, very important. So safety means more the physical thing. So you have you need to have a kind of a redundant scheme. So if one 
a compute center, for example, get destroyed by a disaster. Uh, so this can be a natural disaster. Recently, we have unfortunately seen that also other disasters uh, might occur. Uh, so that's the safety part and the security part is, of course, the uh, cybersecurity and the privacy part is that um, uh, the data protection rules, of course, have to be considered. This is not that relevant for many scientific fields, but for example, it is extremely relevant for uh, all disciplines when 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 humans are involved. Can be can be medicine, can be life sciences, can be social sciences. Okay, th that that's more 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 the funny uh, slide. So uh, typical, yeah. Uh, patterns of thinking or very widespread concerns that are in the brains of people, as I've already mentioned before, computer scientists deliver generic to useless solutions. So it, it might be very nice and very state of the art, but not helpful at all. Uh, or computing and data sense centers typically optimize their operations, but they do not have in mind quality for the users as their most important target. Or I need full control sovereignty of my infrastructure. This is the point that you see still in written proposals uh, when someone wants a kind of a compute cluster. And there are really sometimes extremely funny arguments why this person thinks that the cluster must be in 50 meters of my office, which is I have never seen any or almost never seen any arguments that really are strong arguments. Typically, this is just used as an excuse to get this machine really in my uh, under my sovereignty. Then, of course, this conviction of many domain scientists that all they are doing is extremely singular and not comparable to anything else. I mean, one has to be careful there. To a very significant percentage, 50, 60, 70 percent, I don't know, this is probably true, but there's also a significant part where this is not true, where a, a more general and a more generic solution is helpful and, of course, much more uh, economic. And then the nice thing, what, what we call in German the EDA phenomenon, uh, like with public services, Beamter, so in public services, people never count uh, cost of staff, like in industry, if you have a project, in, if a company does a project, they always count and estimate how many people this project binds. And this is immediately reflected in euros. If you have public services, people never do this. Three people from the group or from the team join this because they are ADA. So they are paid uh, and they are here. So why should we, why should this produce uh, additional cost? And this is frequently also the case with with let's say technicians. So uh, I have Mr. Müller. Mr. Mr. Müller is my uh, very sophisticated technician, and he is a, he is on the payroll. So I don't need a specific a specific new technician for my compute cluster. I can do this uh, in my in my office. Um, and then there are a lot of, and it's maybe a bit more problematic. There are a lot of uh, infrastructure. Uh, that is justified by science only. For example, if someone applies for, a, or if a group of scientists applies for a Sonder Forschungsbecher Collaborative Research Center or an excellence cluster in the Excellence Initiative, uh, there is typically part related to infrastructure. And, and in chapter something, it is mentioned that if you look at the research activities of the researchers involved, uh, all are doing computations, all are doing data analytics, so we need some kind of a machine or an, a system particularly dedicated to this to this project. And then they they ask for that. And uh, typically the reviewers of such a thing, uh, they come out of the, the research discipline. So the chemists appraise what their colleagues from chemistry have, have written down there, and they of course agree that they need a lot of uh, computational infrastructure. They need access to clusters or, what, or whatever. And at the end of the day, I've, I've had this in many, many evaluation meetings. Uh, the, the reviewers discuss for hours whether to one project, two and a half or two researchers should be given. But at the end, 
when there is a question and there is this proposal for a 2 million uh, cluster, should we give that? Typically within 20 seconds, everyone says, yes, of course, they need that. And I mean, that's, that's really ridiculous because this means that at the end of the day, you individual researchers get a lot of money to place infrastructure just somewhere. And the proper answer at that point would have to be no, uh, the, the CRC does not need a cluster. The CRC needs direct and easy access to cycles. So it might be that we give them the money uh, in order to ensure that they have the access, but please don't build up an infrastructure as a project uh, uh, on your own. This is sometimes needed, but in many cases it is not needed. Okay, then for this recursive thing, uh, I mentioned that briefly in the beginning, there are two dimensions of infrastructure for the NFDI. So the NFDI perspective, infrastructure aspect needed by the sum all consortia across NFDI. So what is it that they need beyond, as I said, toilet paper and how should it be offered? How should it be provided? And that's what we see now, these cross-sectional topics and this basis discussion. And the second dimension is the Fermat internal uh, perspective now infrastructure aspects needed across Fermat again by all or by many uh, of the different groups uh, and topics that are um, clustered uh, within Fermat and this of course has to be answered by Fermat and this, this leads me to the last uh, part of that uh, presentation of today that how we want to do it or we are actually have begun to do it um, in uh, Fermat. So those who know Fermat, uh, I don't, to them, I don't show anything new. Everyone who is not from Fermat might maybe have a brief look at that. So there are um, maybe three different uh, really domain fields uh, dealing with material science or with solid state physics or synthesis experimental research and theory and computation. So these are the areas A, B, C, and then there is the area D, which is a particular area just addressing infrastructure. So to, to some extent, this is a kind of a centralized or federated uh, uh, group that uh, shall develop the things that are needed in the different uh, uh, areas. So we have organized it as a separate area, but of course, in very close collaboration with um, the other areas, there's even the idea that we have shared people, so people who are to some extent on the payroll of Area D and to some extent on, a, on, an, on another payroll that they really um, deliver this kind of a bridge. Um, um, so what are the different topics we address in um, Fermat? Uh, so probably, not that surprising for everyone who has dealt with this uh, topic uh, for some time. So metadata is really something I think that that concerns all kind of uh, communities. So how do we organize? How do we describe uh, our uh, different different data? Then there's the question of the repositories. So this is really the thing now: how local, how central, where shall, what kind of data really reside? And this is done in this uh, oasis sense. I will come back to that on the next slide or on the second next slide. Connectivity is not that a big topic, but it is important that you keep it in mind. Then for the experimental people, there's of course this important topic of the uh, electronic uh, lab notebooks or the laboratory um, information management uh, system. And then there needs to be a portal uh, through which Researchers on the one hand can upload something in an organized way, but other researchers then, of course, also can uh, download, can or can get access to to this treasury of of data in a in a in a in a fair sense. So you see from that slide that this is basically, hopefully, all the topics that have to be addressed, and that's what currently happens now in this uh, area D, in close collaborations, of course, with the with the uh, different area, uh, other areas. And maybe also that uh, organization of data always means what kind of data are we talking of? I mean, using the word data is, 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 is very easy and very fast these days. Everyone uh, uses it. 
but on the other hand it's not that clear what kind of data people are really talking of and for that that's something which has already been written down in the proposal there's of course also kind of a of a layered view or, or of a pyramid of different um, yeah types of of the, of data so from the from bottom to top the volume gets a bit smaller and uh, the way of procuring it gets a bit more uh, centralized so there will, in tier 3 there will be a couple of data that uh, where the data and the metadata are uh, centralized but for many many uh, raw data uh, they will be kept locally also within this format system and maybe even the metadata are uh, kept locally so the funny thing is that the tier counting here is just the other way around than it is that has been done in the hpc um, landscape and now this oasis well, concept is maybe something which is a bit uh, interesting so there is this uh, yeah mother uh, one could say mother architecture nomad that stands for novel materials discovery and that comes of this um, center of excellence that has been funded by the, by the European Union for material science. And following this picture of a nomad, then there are oases where the nomads go to. And uh, so this is basically kind of an, a local institution or a local system, a local mirroring of the uh, central. So using the same software, using the same um, system, but having maybe different uh, kinds of data, different types of data that are actually locally stored compared to the uh, global or the central nomad architecture system. And in this picture on the, at the bottom left, you see two different loops. So the, so the left loop would basically be what happens locally. So you can uh, create data locally. You can put them into your uh, local uh, oasis installation and everything is fine. And then we have this outer bigger loop where you create your data locally. And then you upload and publish them in the center in the central system and then it is actually published it is visible for for everyone and again everything is fine and what is currently work under construction is that we have this missing link so that you can actually combine uh, the two the inner and the outer uh, cycle and that data that are locally stored can be automatically uh, uploaded to the uh, central system and then in a in a predefined way for example that some aspects shall be publicly visible others maybe 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 not so this is this oasis concept and 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 that's one of the battlefields uh, we are currently working on in, in this area d of um, okay so i assumed that also i designed it only for 30 minutes it would take a bit more that's why i already reduced the concluding remarks to thank you. So I think everything I wanted to say has been said. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. And now I'm of course open to any kind of questions, remarks, complaints, or whatever you would like to express. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will of course start with complaints. No, I don't have any complaints. Thank you very I much hope for that. your really, really nice lecture. Um, Maybe I take the chance for the first question because uh, that's the benefit of being the host. Um, could you could you maybe project a bit into the future? I mean, we, we are now in the first funding period for Fermat, then there will be a second funding period. And if I'm not mistaken, then the whole thing should stand on its own feet and will be uh, transformed into a in, uh, yeah, standing infrastructure. Do you think that is possible? And what has to be done in order to finance and run this afterwards? Yeah, I mean, so this sustainability is is always a big issue. So I think there will be core elements that will will survive because they are they will be taken over by the by the by the institutions. Institutions have get used to that they have to procure a little bit of infrastructure to keep that running, and I think that will that that will work. Uh, the bigger thing is probably, for example. Yeah, or, let, or let's say also for data, this will work because if people are used to uploading something or for, for looking for something here and there, this is also something which does not, probably does not meet, need too much, in, too much infrastructure. 
A crucial thing, and that has been visible in many, many previous comparable situations, is software maintenance. So as long as everything nicely runs, uh, you don't need that much funding. But then comes a new version of this operating system here and the new version of this uh, electronic lab book software there. And then suddenly someone detects that something does not, does not work anymore. And if, the done, if then there is not someone who really has the mandate and the funding to correct that, to integrate that, to solve that within four or six weeks, then people start getting the experience, this doesn't work anymore. And then they quit. And then we will see that participation was increasing and then participation is declining again. And, and that's why I think there are a couple of aspects where we need uh, a sustained thing. And this can come through permanent external funding, like we have seen it with this big data and, and AI centers. But it also can, of course, come from a from a permanent commitment of the institutions. I mean, the universities, for example, they also invest currently in their IT infrastructure. They have their local clusters and, and whatever. So if it's, it really becomes obvious that this kind of an infrastructure is a critical one for their scientists to being able to publish and to be front, front and to do front end research anymore. So then of course, the university and research institution can also invest in that kind of sustained infrastructure. But this is definitely something which is not an automatism one has to take care of. Okay, but but do you think that this will be, I mean, for example, Fermat is dominantly located at Humboldt University with, of course, other contributors. So, so will this be a Humboldt thing or is this, will it remain distributed? This I, I find the, the structures that it has now is, or that all of these consortia have is, Probably very nice for the development. Hi, Markus. <laughs> but not so nice um, yeah. for essentially uh, bringing it in a sustainable, stable yeah. solution. Yeah, I think each each way of structuring it has its own own problems. In Fermat, they did it in a much more central way than than other NFDI consortia. I know it has the advantage that you really can operate with a with a, uh, a critical mass. It also has the um, chance that maybe the university that where it is now residing at a, at a big uh, extent. So for example, in this case, Humboldt University will also take over some responsibility for the sustainable thing. So there, there could be, this could be also a positive effect. On the other hand, if you, if you subdivide it, you say, okay, I have, money for 100 positions. I have 100 partner universities. Okay, each partner university gets one, one, one position. At the first glance, this, this looks nice. Everyone is motivated. But then for keeping the whole thing, at the end of the day, you need that all of these partner institutions could really go on to contribute uh, to this sustained structure and invest something. And this is maybe even more complicated than if you just have to uh, convince one, two, or three university leadership. So I think there is no, no, no inherent, no systematical advantage of the one of the other. Each of this way of organizing it has its own problems and its own chances, and one just has to look has to look at, at an early time how this can be then transferred into a sustained model. Okay. So are there further questions from the audience? Uh, you could, for example, just unmute your video or raise your hand or type in the chat or make a funny noise? Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's, it's basically about, uh, so I, I, I completely agree. And I think it's very important to have a general system, but which is still customizable. And, uh, and the, the basic question is, what do you think about uh, uh, this virtualization, like, like using a machine as a service or at the level of application like Kubernetes? instead of using the, the same way how we use uh, HPC systems nowadays? Um, yes, for many cases, but not for all of them. So um, um, we have had this discussion, for example, last, last week uh, or two weeks ago when there was the, the bar meeting of the uh, Max Planck Society and there was also, we, we discussed models, operations and models for next, next generation system. And it's quite clear that 
all of these kind of virtualized cloud-based whatever kind of things, they will have an increasing relevance. So this is not something which will not be present anymore, but it will not replace the classical HPC completely because there are still these kind of huge tasks that just need uh, a, a very well-defined big machine for a specific uh, number of cycles or a specific amount of time. So I think this is more the question that we have different architectures. So for example, these virtual things are definitely probably better suited for some kind of CPU based thing than, than for classical HPC, but we will see these things. And I think uh, if you design an IT infrastructure, one has uh, to be ready uh, to integrate all of these things and also to let them play together. I mean, if you, every time you need an explicit data transfer on explicit IO, if you're doing something in the own world, in the one world and would now like to transfer the data, the results to the other world. And if this isn't a terabyte or whatever explicit data thing, because the repositories are different, then you have a, have a problem. So that's why there has to be an integrated view uh, of the system that you can combine it. And, and that's probably what, what we will see in the, in the, in the future. So th that's similar with this GPU and CPU thing. People always tend to have this either or kind of discussions and and I think it's much more in much more situations it is really the both end uh, issue and not the either or issue okay thank you thank you very much okay thank you very much thank you also Adam for the question okay but yeah then um, I can only thank you again very much for your talk Hans this was very nice um, yeah, and, of, and of course, if there are any kind of uh, following uh, questions or questions popping up later, just just send me an email. So that's, of course, uh, not limited to this couple of minutes now here. Yeah, that's a good idea too. Okay, then see you all next time or also on other occasions and yeah, have a nice way home. <laughs>